Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number nine of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. This lesson is titled Jerusalem Controversies and is ready for teaching on Sabbath, August 31. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the stories that occur here in the book of Mark. Thank you for what Jesus says and how he guides us in our lives. And as we read these stories this week, as we look at the word that comes from Jesus for each of us, that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that we may be blessed, and that our families may be blessed as well, Lord. And today I'd like to pray for Sonia Brown of New York and her friends who listen, and for Hazel from Morant Bay Church, and Hilda Santos and her family, and Andra Knight Wells and her family, and including the family of Venus Wallen as well. Lord, I pray today for all of our families, whether we have older members or younger members than us as members of our family, Lord, we know that we care for them and that you care for them as well. And I'd like to pray for today for our children who are at school, those who are at college or university, that their faith and their strength and their hope in their Jesus may become firmer and stronger as they grow older as they become more mature. And I'd like to pray also for those of us who are alone, whether it be by choice or by circumstances. And as we open your word now, may you be reflected in our lives to those about us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, memory text this week is Mark chapter 11 and verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. And today, young Melanie is going to reread that text for us. Thank you, Melanie. I'm Melanie from Harvey Bay, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 11, verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. A series of five controversies between Jesus and the religious leaders are recorded in Mark chapter 2 and verse 3, and we looked at those in lesson 3. In this week's lesson, when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, he has a series of six controversies with the religious leaders. The two sets of controversies are like bookends of his earthly ministry. Each set deals with important issues in the Christian life. Jesus' instructions, even in these polemical situations, help guide believers both in fundamental issues of faith and in practical issues of everyday experience. The religious leaders come to confront, confound and defeat Jesus, but they never succeed. Part of this week's lesson will include analysing just what it is that brings people into opposition to God and considering what Christians can do to break through prejudice and speak to the hearts of those resisting the Spirit's call. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus' ministry will be in Jerusalem for Passover. That's sometime in March to April. Mark 11 to 16 covers little more than one week. The narrative time has slowed down remarkably. The first ten chapters cover approximately three and a half years. This slowdown now points to the importance of these closing scenes. Sunday, August 25, the Triumphal Entry Read Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11, and Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10. What's happening here? First of all, Mark 11, beginning at verse 1. 
As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Half of this story involves Jesus sending two disciples to a nearby village to retrieve a donkey for him to ride on into Jerusalem. Why is so much time spent on this account? The answer is twofold. First, It demonstrates Jesus' prophetic powers, enhancing the dignity of his arrival and linking it to the will of God. Second, this aspect of the story links to Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10, which speaks of the king as riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. It is reminiscent of the entry of Solomon into Jerusalem on a donkey. We read about that in 1 Kings verses 1, 32 and 48. And it happened when Adonijah tried to usurp the throne, and David commanded that Solomon be immediately crowned. Let's read 1 Kings, starting at verse 32 in chapter 1. King David said, Call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah, son of Jehoiada. When they came before the king, he said to them, Take your Lord's servants with you, and have Solomon my son mount my own mule, and take him down to Gihon. There have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon! Then you are to go up with him, and he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I have appointed him ruler over Israel and Judah. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my lord, the king, so declare it. As the Lord was with my lord, the king, so may he be with Solomon to make his throne even greater than the throne of my lord, King David. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, the Kerathites and the Pelathites, went down and had Solomon mount King David's mule, and they escorted him to Gihon. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpet, and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went up after him, playing pipes and rejoicing greatly, so that the ground shook with the sound. Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they were finishing their feast. On hearing the sound of the trumpet, Joab asked, What's the meaning of all the noise in the city? Even as he was speaking, Jonathan, son of Abiathar, the priest, arrived. 
Adonijah said, Come in, a worthy man like you must be bringing good news. Not at all, Jonathan answered. Our Lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Kerethites and the Pelethites, and they have put him on the king's mule. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king of Gihon. From there they have gone up cheering, and the city resounds with it. That's the noise you hear. Moreover, Solomon has taken his seat on the royal throne. Also, the royal officials have come to congratulate our Lord King David, saying, May your God make Solomon's name more famous than yours, and his throne greater than yours. And the king bowed down in worship on his bed and said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. In the book Desire of Ages, page 569, we read, Five hundred years before the birth of Christ, the prophet Zechariah thus foretold the coming of the King of Israel. This prophecy is now to be fulfilled. He who has so long refused royal honours now comes to Jerusalem as the promised heir to David's throne. End of quote. Jerusalem is located in a hilly region at the elevation of about 740 metres or 2,400 feet. In Jesus' day, its population was perhaps 40 to 50,000, but swelled at Passover. The city covered only about 250 acres, but the Temple Mount covered about 37 of those acres. The beautiful temple complex dominated the city. Jesus entered from the east, descending the Mount of Olives and likely entering through the Golden Gate into the Temple Mount, a gate that's now bricked shut. The entire city was stirred by his entry, everyone recognising the significance of his symbolic action. The crowd that accompanied Jesus shouted, Hosanna, a term originally meaning, save now, but eventually coming to mean, praise to God. The time for secrecy, which Jesus had insisted throughout most of Mark, has passed. Now Jesus openly enters Jerusalem using a well-known royal symbolic action. He enters the temple, but because it is late in the day, he simply looks around and then retires with the twelve disciples to Bethany. What could have turned into a riot or revolt instead ends up with him quietly retiring. But the next day will be different. And so to finish today, the idea of riding on the donkey invokes the idea of humility. Why is that such an important trait, especially for Christians? What have we, in the light of the cross, to be proud about? Monday, August 26, A Cursed Tree and a Cleansed Temple Read Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 26. What is the significance of the events depicted here? Mark 11, let's begin at verse 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And, as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. 
Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. In the morning, coming from Bethany, only about two miles, a little more than three kilometres from Jerusalem, Jesus was hungry. Seeing a fig tree in leaf, he went to it to find perhaps some early fruit. This action would not be considered stealing, since, according to Old Testament law, one could eat food from a neighbour's field or orchard to assuage hunger. As you read in Leviticus 19.9, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. And Leviticus 23.22 when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. And Deuteronomy 23 verse 25. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. But he found no fruit and said to the tree, No one ever eat fruit from you again, in verse 14 of Mark 11. It was a very strange and atypical action for Jesus, but what follows right after becomes even more striking. What happens next likely occurs in the court of the Gentiles, where selling of sacrifices took place, recently begun by Caiaphas. Jesus clears away the sellers from the courts so that quiet worship may return. His action is a direct affront to those in charge of the temple system. Jesus links two Old Testament passages as a scathing rebuke of the unholy traffic. He insists the temple is to be a house of prayer for all people, as you read in Isaiah 56 verse 7, emphatically including the Gentiles. Let's read Isaiah 56, 7. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Then he says the leaders have made the temple a den of robbers. As you read in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 11, Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Then, at the end of this amazing day, Jesus leaves the city with his disciples, as we read in Mark 11 verse 19. The next morning, going back to the city, as we read in verses 20 to 26, the disciples are astonished to see the fig tree withered from the roots. Jesus makes a lesson about prayer and forgiveness in his explanation of what has happened. What does this all mean? These two stories are the fourth sandwich story in Mark. We saw the first one in Lesson 3. In such stories, dramatised irony occurs with parallel characters doing opposite actions or opposite characters doing parallel actions. In this story, the fig tree and the temple stand in parallel. Jesus curses the tree but cleanses the temple. Opposite actions. But the irony is that the religious leaders will now plot to kill Jesus, and that action will spell the end of the significance of the temple services which were fulfilled in Jesus. And so, to finish today, what things in your life do you need Jesus to clean? How does this happen? Tuesday, August 27, 
Who said you could say that? Read Mark chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. What challenge did the religious leaders bring to Jesus, and how did he respond? Mark 11, beginning at verse 27. They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will answer you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say, from heaven, he will ask, Then why didn't you believe him? But if we say, of human origin... They feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet, so they answered Jesus, We don't know. Jesus said, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The day after Jesus cleanses the temple, the religious leaders confront him in the temple courts, asking by what authority he acted the day before. They are not seeking truth, but seeking to trap him. If he says that his authority is from God, they will deny that a simple country carpenter could have such authority. If he admits that his authority is human, they will dismiss him as a fool. But Jesus sees through their trap and says he will answer their question if they will answer one he asks. What he asks is whether John the Baptist's baptism was from God or from men. Instantly, the leaders see that they are the ones trapped. If they say, from God, Jesus will say, why did you not believe him? If they say, from men, they fear the people. So they lie and say they do not know. This gives Jesus the opportunity to refuse to answer their question. Read Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12. How did Jesus follow up his refusal to answer And what effect did it have? Mark 12, beginning at verse 1. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the winepress, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But... They seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others, some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read the passage of Scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Jesus tells a parable about a vineyard, an owner, and tenants to whom he rents the field. The story Jesus tells has great similarities to the parable of the vineyard found in Isaiah 9, where God brings a charge against unfaithful Israel. Everyone would consider the parallel, especially the religious leaders. The story unfolds in a most unusual way, as the tenants refuse to give any of the fruits of the field to the owner. Instead, they mistreat and kill his servants. Finally, the owner sends his beloved son, whom he expects them to respect. But not so. 
They tragically reason that if they kill the son, the vineyard will be theirs. This illogic is striking, and the judgment to be meted out on them is justified. In this story, Jesus is giving the religious leaders a solemn warning as to where their steps are heading. Seen in this light, his parable is a loving forewarning. It is not too late for them to change and avoid certain judgment. Some will repent, change, and accept Jesus. Others will not. Wednesday, August 28, Earthly Duties and Heavenly Outcomes Read Mark chapter 12, verses 13 to 27. What is going on here, and what truths does Jesus teach? Well, we look at verse 13 and onwards in Mark chapter 12. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died leaving no child. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, the woman died too. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the Scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. The religious leaders were trying to catch Jesus in something they could use to condemn him either to the Roman governor or to the people. In this controversy, it was the question of paying taxes. In this time and place, refusing to pay taxes could be taken as rebellion against the Roman government, a serious offence. Jesus' reply to give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's kept him out of a trap and also provided profound instruction on the believer's responsibility to the government. In the book The Desire of Ages, page 602, we read, he declared that since they were living under the protection of the Roman power, they should render to that power the support it claimed, so long as this did not conflict with a higher duty. But, while peaceably subject to the laws of the land, they should at all times give their first allegiance to God. End of quote. What follows next is a question about the resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees were a priestly group that accepted only the five books of Moses as scripture. They did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. The scenario they presented to Jesus was probably hypothetical. It involved seven brothers and one woman. 
According to the law of Moses, when a man who died left no sons, his brother would marry the widow to maintain property in a family line, and any children born to that union would be legally those of the dead man. We read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 to 10. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfil the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother, so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfil the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, This is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Seeking to throw discredit on the doctrine of the resurrection, the Sadducees point to a moral dilemma of whose wife the woman would be in the resurrection. Jesus counters their argument in two steps, referring to the scriptures and to the power of God. First, he describes the power of God in the resurrection and indicates that there will not be marriage in heaven. Then he defends the doctrine of the resurrection by appealing to Exodus 3 verses 1 to 22, where God indicates that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Jesus implies that this means that they will be raised. They cannot remain dead if God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who are for now dead. So let's look at Exodus chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt, into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. And so to finish the day, if someone were to ask you, Do you know the power of God? What would you reply, and why? Thursday, August 29, The Greatest Commandment Read Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. What deep question did the friendly scribe ask, and what double response did Jesus give? Let's start with Mark 12 and verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself, is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, most of the religious leaders, with few exceptions, are antagonistic to Jesus. This is particularly true in Jerusalem, where Jesus has confronted the leadership over temple worship, that which stands at the heart of Judaism. Thus, for a scribe to listen to the disputes and appreciate Jesus' response displays both honesty and courage in face of the prevailing animosity toward Jesus. It would be easier to just stand back and watch, even if one were in sympathy with Jesus. But this man does not do that. The scribe cuts to the heart of religion with his question as to which commandment is the most important. Jesus responds with simplicity and clarity, quoting the Shema, the confession of faith in Judaism from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. And we'll read that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. The greatest commandment, says Jesus, is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. That is, with the totality of who you are. 
Jesus gives the scribe a bonus by listing the second most important commandment, citing the Old Testament again, this time from Leviticus 19 verse 18, to love your neighbour as yourself. Leviticus 19.18 reads, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. Sometimes people wonder how it is possible to command love. The cultural context of the command in Deuteronomy helps explain. The language comes from ancient treaties between parties, and the term for love refers to being faithful to the requirements of the treaty, faithfully fulfilling them. Thus, while it does not rule out the concept of deep affection between parties, it is much more focused on actions that demonstrate such loyalty. The scribe was honest and saw the clarity and simplicity of Jesus' response and said so. One can imagine scowls from other religious leaders since the honest scribe was affirming Jesus' reply as valid, something no one else was willing to do. Jesus also affirmed the scribe for his honest answer, saying he was not far from the kingdom of God. Not far does not mean inside. What the scribe still needed was to recognise who Jesus was and follow him, a further step in the journey of faith. And so to finish today, how do we learn to love God and to love our neighbours as ourselves? Why is the cross the key to following these commands? Friday, August 30, Further Thought. From The Desire of Ages, page 584, we read, Christ's act in cursing the tree which his own power had created stands as a warning to all churches and to all Christians. No one can live the law of God without ministering to others. But there are many who do not live out Christ's merciful, unselfish life. Some who think themselves excellent Christians do not understand what constitutes service for God. They plan and study to please themselves. They act only in reference to self. Time is of value to them only as they can gather for themselves. In all the affairs of life, this is their object. Not for others, but for themselves do they minister. God created them to live in a world where unselfish service must be performed. He designed them to help their fellow men in every possible way. But self is so large that they cannot see anything else. They are not in touch with humanity. Those who thus live for self are like the fig tree, which made every pretension but was fruitless. They observe the forms of worship, but without repentance or faith. In profession they honour the law of God, but obedience is lacking. They say, but do not. In the sentence pronounced on the fig tree, Christ demonstrates how hateful in his eyes is this vain pretense. He declares that the open sinner is less guilty than is he who professes to serve God, but who bears no fruit to his glory. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Ponder the meaning of Christ cleansing the temple. How might that principle apply to our church today? How should such a cleansing take place? 2. All through the Gospels, again and again, Jesus refers to the Scriptures and how they must be fulfilled. What does this tell us about just how central they are to the life of faith? Why must we fervently reject any attempt to downplay the authority of Scripture, especially the idea that the Scriptures are merely people's own ideas about God, who God is, and how He operates? 3. Where is the proper line between church and state? How does Jesus' teaching in Mark 12, 13-17 guide this discussion. Let's reread it again, beginning at verse 13 of Mark chapter 12. Later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, 
We know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. And question number four. Look up texts that talk about the resurrection. Why is this doctrine so central to our faith, especially considering the state of the dead? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Dream Changes Father's Life by Andrew McChesney Anoush had prayed for years for Father to come to God. After Father allowed her and Mother to return to church on Sabbaths, she began to pray even more earnestly, pleading with God to reveal himself to Father. I don't want to be the centre of this story. Ignore me, she prayed. Speak to Father through dreams, visions or friends. I just want his salvation. She surrendered the matter to God. It's about you and him, she said. Then Father had a dream. In it, he saw fire raining down on a city located near their town in Armenia. He saw some people running and screaming and others who were peaceful and singing. Father was astonished. He told Anush and Mother about the dream. About the same time, Anush watched an online sermon about the Holy Spirit, and she told Father about it. The preacher said the fire of the Holy Spirit protects us from the fire of hell, she said. When you get the fire of the Holy Spirit, you won't be scared of the fire at the end of the world. Something clicked. Father understood that the frightened people in his dream didn't have the Holy Spirit and were afraid of hell fire, while the peaceful people were not afraid because they had received the fire of the Holy Spirit. He remembered reading that the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, descended on Jesus at his baptism, as read in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. I need to get baptised, Father said. But the words sounded strange to him, even as they came out of his mouth. Armenia prides itself as the first country to adopt Christianity in 301 AD, and many Armenians consider it their duty to be Christian. They were baptised as infants, not as adults. Now, Father wasn't sure what to do. You have the Bible, Anush said. Read it. Let the Bible answer your questions. Let the Bible lead you to the right church. Father read the Bible even more earnestly. One day, a friend asked him why he was reading the Bible so intently. Is it something to boast about? The friend asked. If Jesus came tomorrow, would you say, I have read the Bible? Would that be enough? The question shocked Father. His whole body trembled. A short time later, when he had left the friend's house and was alone in his car, he poured out his heart to God. If Jesus came tomorrow, what would I say to him? He prayed. If Jesus really came, what would I say to him? He went home and told Mother, I'll go to the church with you next Sabbath. But Father didn't want to go to the town's house church, which was comprised of seven women. Let's go to the church in the next town, he said. From that Sabbath, Father began to worship every week in church. Today's reading. I'm reading while the sun is shining brightly, the birds are singing, and the kangaroos are hopping. It is a glorious day. Thank you.